Hi, and welcome back to Starlight Talks. I'm here with Newton, and hopefully Ian can join us when he can. And we're gonna talk about the book, Asperger's Autism and You, that Ian wrote. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about that and how I ended up on the cover. Um, so anyway, as usual, check out the website, artism.com, where you can find more of my blogs where I write about living on the spectrum. Check out our support groups and life map and everything we offer. It's a really cool website, which we're updating really soon. Um, on top of that, I have um, a workshop that I'm going to be doing in Florida. So check that out if you're from Florida or going to be in Florida around April. Um, I also do these live streams every Wednesday at 7 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, so come back next week. This week I'm joined by Newton, and hopefully Ian can join us in a bit. So, Newton, do you want to introduce a little bit about who you are? Yes. Hi, Chloe. Thank you for inviting me. And... Uh, you know, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm the founder and president of the Institute for Education, Research, and Scholarships. And I started the nonprofit uh, when I was uh, working full time at Disney. Um, in fact, I was working full time at Disney and I was also teaching at Woodbury University. And Chloe was one of my students. Um, and then at the same time, I also created my nonprofit. Um, so basically, we really focus on education because we believe that education is the key to you know, solving a lot of problems in the world. And besides the fact that you know, education also enrich you know, everybody. So enriching ourselves and helping the world. So that's education. And then research, we do um, a lot of research, like for example, in autism, in uh, medical uh, research, in social science, it's basically in cybersecurity. So basically across all spectrums of uh, of you know uh, issues in the world that we want to solve. So I know we are quite uh, what do you call it uh, ambitious. <laughs> yes, I am myself are very ambitious, and that's why I want my organization to be ambitious as well. And then of course scholarships part is you know that's uh, uh, simple. It's basically we you know give scholarships to students around the world whether they are studying um, medicine or studying filmmaking. So it's all, it's all, you know, we're trying to help students who can afford to go to school. So that's the organization. And uh, Dr. Ian Hell uh, is one of the, uh, my friends, and he himself is suffering from autism and Asperger uh, syndrome. And he, but he's a good writer, he's a good thinker, he's a good, you know, scientist. And that's why when he approached me about you know, writing a book and publishing it, under IFRS, the nonprofits that I'm running, I say, of course, it's a wonderful idea. So, you know, there have been several revisions of the manuscript and uh, finally, you know, put things together. But then I decided that, well, we need a cover. A lot of books, you just, you know, print big text on the book. I mean, I've written a lot of books myself and usually they just have a title of the book on the cover. There's nothing else, right? Because it's very academic. But this book is more than just academic. It's really, you know, based on personal experience. Um, and I think, you know, who's better to be on the cover than one of my students or former students. So that's why I, I asked uh, Chloe, I said, would you like to be on cover? And Chloe, of course, you know, you read the book first before you make a decision. Um, so I guess people want to know what you think about the book and why do you like it so much? Well, I really love that it's a book about autism written by someone who has it because when you have that distance from it you can really look at it more in a negative light where he was able to be very objective and say there's pros to it there's cons to it and this is what it's like living with it this is what the diagnosis process is like and focus on those areas that were important to him which would be important to someone who is just figuring out they have autism or figuring out a family member had autism and wanting to know about it. 
which I thought was really great that he would explain things really simply and then put his own antidote. So he's like, here's the scientific version of everything. And then here's where it applied to my life. And so a lot of things about autism are, are written from a, a doctor's perspective who's not, um, so doesn't know anyone who has it, doesn't have it personally, or written by a parent, someone who doesn't have a personal relationship with it. So I thought it was really cool that he also lives with it so he understands it personally. Mm -hmm. okay, Ian just joined. I hope if uh, add him <laughs> that no one will freeze. <laughs> so I'm going to try and add him right now. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> good evening, Chloe, Professor Lee, all Hi. audience, and good evening to California. <laughs> Hi, so we're live right now, just so you're aware. How are you all? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Thank you for joining. So we were. Well, it's a great, it's a great pleasure to do it, and I thank you for the invite. Um. So, uh, viewers, if you're not aware, Ian is joining us all the way from Spain. <laughs> So he's up at four in the morning to do this. Oh, uh, yeah. So what, what would you like to me me to refer you as? Is Ian okay? Would you like Doctor Hale? Um, Ian is Ian is fine. Ian is fine. Okay. <laughs> so we were just talking about what my first impression of the book was, and I was saying I really appreciated that it was a book about autism written by someone who personally experiences it. I feel like that's really rare and yeah. a really important factor in your book. Yes, I, I, I feel that it's a combination of things. Um, my experience as a teacher and obviously learning about neurodiversity as part of my teacher training, uh, my experience of you know, being autistic and um, my experience as someone who's studied genetics, some of the neuroscience of it as well. So, uh, sort of coming at it from three or four different directions, as well as my professional experience uh, as having worked with people, you know, with autism with uh, and with other forms of neurodiversity. Um, that's that's been as well as, well as people who aren't, of course. Uh, and over the time, I sort of learned the contrast and was been able to express better. And that was that was one of the reasons for writing the book. What I was trying to do was, was share these sort of four different angles of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and there were some really interesting facts I found in like a, that a lot of people with autism are drawn to pastel colors and like some really fun things like that. So where did you find all, all that kind of information? Uh, countless hours of research, basically, plus the, the experience of stories that people on the spectrum and you know people with other neurodiversities have told me over the years and I've, I've always been one for making notes so i've got i think professor lee has seen a picture writing table uh with all the all the notes on the on the side and stacks and stacks of paper and uh and all the rest of it so i sort of collated all that and reference them, uh, plus obviously my own memories and my own experiences. Um, so I, when I sent you pictures for the cover, I sent some with my yellow wig, without my yellow wig, in different locations. So I'm curious why you picked the one where I was at the beach with my yellow hair. Yes, and it's a it's a very fine cover indeed, and I thank you both very much for it. It, it really works, and it, it says what it's 
you know, basically it does what it says on the tin. Great. Um, do you, yeah. you want to introduce a little bit of your background, Ian, who you are, um, if there's anything you want to promote besides the book? Well, uh, the other thing I'd, I'd like to promote is the um, Indiegogo uh, crowdfunding for, for the research that I hope to do uh, for, for a, a big research project. What, what it's trying to achieve is to bring out a, the experience of as many people on the spectrum from all over the world as possible to create a, a huge database to make that available to the public uh, through Professor Lee's Foundation IFERS um, to give them a much clearer picture of life on the spectrum across the globe. That's, that's what the, one of the main aims of the project. Well, that is the main aim. Uh, the, the second one is um, the comorbidities of, of being on the spectrum. And the particular one I, I want to focus on, although not the only one in the, in the project I'm hoping to fund, um, is fibromyalgia. Because I've noticed so many people not only have the associated digestive problems with, with autism or Asperger's, whatever else, but it seemed to me when I was doing my master's research that some, a lot of the responses I got to the questionnaires that I put out to provide the data for that were, were also coming back with comments and when we when we data mined the whole collection, um, it, it did it sort of stood out at me, and I thought this is something that, that needs a lot of further investigation, and it's something I'm very passionate about doing. So there are those two things: the, the book because I want to share experiences, and the crowdfunding because I, I want to be able to give the world. Um, a much more sort of three-dimensional picture of life on from age whatever through to you know from eight to eighty, let's say. That, that's the that's the that's the goal. Mm -hmm. I definitely support Ian's research. Uh, as I mentioned before. You know, IFRS Institute for Education Research and Scholarships, we do a lot of different type of research. And this is definitely one of the important research that we need to, you know, do more about. Um, see, the, the, the thing is that a long time ago, you know, autism, Asperger's syndrome, they were not so, you know, well known. And a lot of people, you know, didn't know about what to do. Parents didn't know what to do. For example, my little brother, my younger brother was very difficult, you know, for my parents. Uh, to take care of because he just did not behave like a regular child. Um, he, was, he was very strange and we didn't know why at that time. Now we do, right? Now it's because of autism, because of Asperger. Uh, but back then they didn't know. So I think, you know, it's, uh, it, we need more research, we need more understanding. And also we need to come up with ideas of how to, you know, uh, lessen the, the effect, how to help children, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, how, what do you say? How do you, um, how, is, how do you, uh, <laughs> Corey, can you help me? So how, how do you well, feel? I'm, what, what I'm looking to do is to, is to try to find out the type of support that they need throughout the whole of life. Mm -hmm. it, it's not only about children, but obviously mm -hmm. as a primary uh, focus, but it's about the experience of older people. For some reason, a lot of the general public, um, and indeed a lot of the professions as well, seem to think that, that autism is something that you grow out of, that suddenly uh, when you get to 18, that's okay, you're on your own. But we all know that, that is not in the least the case. So uh, it's, it's about 
follow through and, and, and that's why I want the project to be so big. Yeah, I found that as well, which is why we created <clears throat> Autism was to start creating programs and support for those who are adults because there's not much out there for adults, especially for the higher functioning or less impacted, whatever term you want to put there. So we created Life Map and we created these support groups and um, various things for for those like me. And I, I would talk about, oh, these are the programs I would like and these this is the support I would wish I existed somewhere. And so instead of waiting for someone else to do it, me and my mom started just creating that. And other people seem to like the ideas I had and such as this live stream, such as my blog and uh, our support groups and life map. So it's been really nice to get the feedback from people and um, all of our programs are critiqued by those on the spectrum. And because that voice is really important because they're the people who are going to get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree totally. Yeah, I think support from friends and family, very important, uh, yeah. very essential. So just give an example, my younger brother is now you know, quite successful in spite of you know, uh, what he used to have, autism, now he's more sociable, not as much as regular people, but still, you know, now he's a family of his own, he has his own business, so you know, everything works out fine for him. Yes, and um, we hope to, you know, to to make that much a much better understood thing, and and to support people through that. And mm -hmm. um, you and I have talked about this before, Professor Lee, and uh, you know we're very much agreed and very much on the same focus and the same wavelength. And I, I know very well that Chloe is as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I also want to add that uh, is it actually part of the uh, focus that we have for the IFRS Wellness Center. So the Wellness Center that um, is a new initiative, and what I've done is that I put together a group of scientists, biologists, and uh, psychologists, and basically we're looking at how to um, uh, extend human lifespan, but also a quality of life. That's very important. Not only do we want to live longer, but we also want to live healthier, longer. Yes. Okay. So, but that means it's not just physical, but also mental, psychological as well. We need you know, wellness, the whole package, you know, physical well, wellness and you know, mental wellness. And together, you know, you have a really, uh, you know, happy, happy and healthy uh, human being. Uh, because we need that in order to pursue a lot of things like, you know, helping the world, uh, you know, write a new song, write a new book, all kinds of things we want to do. We need to be, you know, in a, in a good state of mind and good, you know, uh, physical health. Yeah, absolutely. Vital. And as you know, um, that the, the IME projects are very much of an end of mine. I, I know Dr. Aubrey de Grey, I, I was at too in Cambridge and, uh, and, I, and I followed that up from there and uh, one of the people that um, involved in that is uh, my friend Anna Alonzi who I know you've spoken with or communicated with mm -hmm. so yes it is as you say when you say that that it is all part of a package that's that's absolutely hit the nail on the head completely Yeah. As you rightly say, if you if we make people healthier and happier, the more people we make that way, healthier and happier the world will be. And and surely that is that is one of life's great purposes. And and that's another reason for, for writing this book and pursuing the project. And the project that, that you just spoke about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I found 
not only is there not much information about autism, but there's a lot of misinformation as well. So I'm really glad this book is out there to start balancing that and going, here's someone with autism who is telling you that these are the facts, this is what I live with, that hopefully will people will look at that as the right answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of which, you're right. We got the social media and things like that. You know, you don't know what is truth and what's not anymore. It's very hard to distinguish sometimes, sometimes. Especially if you, if you see a video on social media, you form your judgment, but then it turns out to be false because you don't know what's happened before, what's happened afterwards, and what's the context, right? Just give just a, an example. So um, one of my earlier books, uh, Facebook Nation, I talk a lot about, you know, the social media impact on people. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, yeah, how do people view, uh, view autism? How do people react? Uh, how, how can parents you know, take care of children who have autism? Things like that. You know, uh, if you look at social media, there are a lot of conversations going on and so on. And, but again, there could be information, good information, but there could be also misinformation. Uh, that's why it's important to have good books, like you know, Ian's uh, book. You know, I'm sure there are other good books as, as well, but you know, it's important to get those good books, read them, and understand, you know, understand what's happening. It is indeed. And also a, a small part of the book is, is to talk about the history of autism, and it, it, it begins by discussing the, the actual history and origin of the word itself. So, because I thought when I, when I started to write it, I thought, you know, where shall I start? And the answer came to me, well, how about go right back to the beginning? Begin with the, with the word and then expand it from there. So that, that was sort of the, the guiding philosophy through the book. I also wanted to make it something that was very accessible. You, you don't have to read it all the way through to get it. The, the chapters are very carefully ordered so that one can almost use it as a reference book once, once you have read it. Um, you know, something handy. I didn't want to write a 400 page text or an academic book like that. There, there are plenty of those, plenty of medical manual things like that, things from the APA and from, you know, the ICD, WHO and numerous others. I wanted something that, particularly in this very fast-paced world, something that, that people actually have the time to get at. So what I was looking to achieve was to get to the, the core of it, and it has a, a very long bibliography for a, a book of its length, and that is, the, the hope there is that that will help people to pursue their own research as well. Um, it's a sort of a a launch pad as well as being very a very concise guide in itself to the best of my ability yes i really like references in books uh, because it gives people a perspective of how to look further how to you know, investigate more into certain things absolutely so let's talk yeah. about the title of the book actually there's a title main title and a subtitle now the subtitle is pretty controversial can you tell us a little bit more about the subtitle and what do you think the answer is? Um, well, the reason I did it, there, there's some, there is, as you say, some controversy about whether Asperger's is a separate condition or whether it is part of the autism spectrum itself. And, and that's an issue that, I, that I've addressed in the book. Uh, the way that I see it is if one looks at, at neurodiversity, as a whole, um, imagine it's a house and you have, you have these rooms, you have, you have autism, you have bipolar, you have schizophrenia and asthma as well. And I see those as different rooms with different purposes, bedroom, kitchen, whatever, but all within the same house of neurodiversity. And, and that's, the, that's the, the way that I wanted to do it. So it's not wholly about autism. I, I do talk about other things as well in it, which again, I hope will be helpful. 
and again comes from my experience of, of being involved with special education for a, frankly a very long time now <laughs> and, and, and the research that went into that because it's possible to be to be autistic and something else and, mm -hmm. and I'm far from sure that people understand that a, a very good example would have been Kurt Cobain the the founder of the the, the band Nirvana Interesting. So what about he, had, he had two types of neurodiversity. I think mm -hmm. most people agreed on that. Um, what about the vaccine that you mentioned? Yes. Well, that that is a very that is a very controversial and a very big topic, mm -hmm. and it's something that I've addressed in a great deal of depth and tried to explain the the, the cons and given people medical guidelines and basically to ask ask them to ask questions and I've, I've tried to make it a guide as to the the most important questions they need to ask their physician or whoever does the vaccinations whether it be a nurse or, or a doctor or whoever else so um, it, it's a topic that I felt it, in all good conscience that I that I couldn't avoid in the book, shouldn't avoid in the book, because I, I felt that would be that would be ducking out of the issue, and mm. and the book is supposed to be about looking at the whole spectrum, and and not deliberately avoiding things just because they're controversial. Exactly. I, like uh, I felt that that would be, I felt to do that, it would have been very easy to, to leave out the vaccination thing, but uh, I felt to do so would be to cheat the readers. Hmm. And so, something smart that you added was that you explained in different places in the world, Asperger's and different terms are used differently, and you explained that very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me go back to vaccines a little bit before we come on. So um, I have, uh, my background is computer science, but I actually apply computer science to biology and medicine since day one of my study uh, in artificial intelligence and computer science. So I can tell, I can tell you that um, human bodies are very complicated, you know. We are still trying to understand our, our brain, understand our mind, you know. It's really complicated. Um, if you try to model, you know, human body and human mind uh, in terms of uh, like a computer program, it's very, very difficult. Now, also, our body reacts differently to different medication or even food or, you know, uh, you know natural, natural stuff, okay, uh, the air we breathe. People react to things differently. So I'm not surprised if vaccines causes different reaction in different people. It's just because we are all individuals. There's no, you know, one size fits all. It's all, you know, is it working for you? Is it working for him? Is it working for her, right? You have, we have to, that's why we have to monitor every single patient, every single individual to get the maximum benefits of any technology, including medical technology. Um, so, you know, that, so that's, I think that's a scientific, you know, argument there. Um, so, you know, you can't say that everything's bad or everything is good. It has to look at, you know, uh, there are other, there, because there are other many factors, right? Because let's say food we eat, we, we also drink water. And, you know, we have, you know, we digest all kinds, we ingest and digest all kinds of things. So sometimes there's something called chemical reactions. Okay. So one of my early uh, computer programs was actually determined, determined it determines automatically chemical reactions in, inside body, uh, drug interaction, and so on. So these kind of things, uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, should be emphasized more than, than they are right now. Um, I think that, you know, so in, in a sense, if you look for a cure for something, same thing. You know, a cure may work for someone better than someone else. Why? Because, you know, everybody, everyone has a different body, different, you know, chemicals, uh, compositions, let's put it that way. Of course, you know, genetic, you can say genetically human beings are this and this and that, 
but individually, everyone is a little different. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I mean, every human genome is unique. Even with identical twins, when you, when you explore their genome, um, and when you sequence it properly with the latest machines like the 454, um, you actually can detect quite noticeable differences even within identical twins. So as you say, it, it boils right down to the individual. What, what I've tried to do in the book is to give as balanced a view as possible um, concerning the, the risk and reward um, uh, yes. Because percentages with, with vaccination and indeed with other things. Right, right. If you think about well, it, I'm, Einstein, uh, twin. Albert Einstein. So on the topic of twins, my, my sister loves to do research and wanted to go into biology. And she, what she found fascinating about twins with autism is a lot of things that, um, such as diseases that would be in the body forever, such as she has Crohn's or, and she has arthritis, it is very unlikely that the other twin will have. But when it comes to autism with an identical twin, it's up like 80 or 90% that they will both have autism. And it's really high also in fraternal twins, which doesn't, all makes sense. So it throws that genome away where in most things, this is how genes work. But with autism, it blows all those rules out of the water. Yes, there's still a great deal we don't know. And I think that it's going to take, I don't know whether Professor Lee will agree with me or not, but I think it is going to take some years before we, we have a, although we've decoded the, the human genome, to actually understand the, in, the interactions between the about 20,000 different genes that we have, and if I remember rightly, about 3 billion different cells just in the brain, um, to understand how Changing one affects all the other 2.9999 billion or whatever it is. It's going to get more computer power than we currently have, and uh, I'm looking forward very much to the to the new generation of computers, which hopefully will be able to to give us a much. Better. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's interesting because. Uh, earlier, I was saying that Albert Einstein, if you think about, you know, you know, such a genius, he was actually, well, today you will say that he also had autism to some, to some extent. Oh, yeah. Yet he's a genius. Okay. So I think, mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, it's, okay, there are things that actually make people, uh, give them some disadvantage right like 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 in social interaction and so on but that doesn't mean that it's a negative thing it could be positive in that einstein keeps himself think about all these ideas um you know in order to come up with you know e equals mc square the you know theory of relativity and so on but then he's also very kind-hearted um, einstein uh, is so popular not only because of his you know uh uh, being a genius in in physical science, but he's also he was yeah. he's such so popular because he's genuinely care about humanity. He cares about people. Uh, he talks about yeah. peace. He talks about you know uh, you know people should treat each other better and, and, and things like that. So he's very active in the social um, you know uh, cons social areas, not just scientific areas. So. Uh, I noticed that in um, Ian's uh, new bio, you mentioned about uh, transhumanism, in a sense, right? The H plus yes. transhumanism. So in transhumanism, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, we not only talk about understanding our physical uh, in the body and our mental you know, states, but we also talk about enhancing ourselves. So in a sense, you know. Uh, we can enhance ourselves so that 
the handicapped people can walk again. Just to give an example. The blind people can see it again. And of course, you know, uh, sick people will get well again. Okay, so all these are transhumanist uh, thoughts or endeavors. Um, so I think in, in, instead of uh, looking at autism as a disadvantage, we can look at it as a positive thing because Einstein had it. So now you can become a genius because, you know, you're autistic, right? I know, I mean, we can look at life positive in a positive way or negative way. So it's better to look at life in a positive way. And transhumanism, I believe, give us the, the hope and the tools, scientific tools, to actually achieve something bigger. Do you agree? Yeah, I like Very the, much so. the reframing. Instead of looking at someone with autism and seeing all the negatives, you can turn it into a positive. Like this person is super focused on one thing. Why can't I get them to pay attention to anything else? We'll find why don't you let them be really interested in whatever they're interested in and research it and really understand it? Because that's a rarity for someone to be so focused on something. Like take these ideas that are that you think are negative and turn them into a positive and celebrate that this person is different. Exactly. Yes. In Star Trek, we say the infinite diversity and infinite combination. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned Einstein, but uh, we, in the book I've, I've not listed, but made reference to other extremely gifted people on the spectrum. Um, one of the great scientists of all time, Amy Manzato, uh, to uh, refuse a Nobel Prize, um, Nikola Tesla. We know he was, for example. I've, I've mentioned Kurt Cobain, an, another famous musician I would mention, who very clearly Asperger's, in, in retrospect from what we know now, would be Jim Morrison. The, I'm sure everybody knows about in California. I think he's, he's pretty famous there. Is that correct, Chloe? What? what? In California, probably would still know who Jim Morrison was. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a phenomenally gifted writer, poet, singer, uh, and yet there was a lot more to him as well. The same as Einstein. I mean, Einstein was was a musician. There was there was that very sort of connected artistic side as well. And, and you find this quite often in people with neurodiversity. Um, the great mathematician, John Nash, would be another example. He, the man whose uh, biography is a film, uh, A Beautiful Mind. Mm -hmm. I believe Russell Crowe. Yeah. And uh, so somebody else we, 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 we should mention. Uh, Dr. Temple Grandin. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. She she was the the pioneer of really bringing autism out into the public, she, and, and she still does. I think of her as the Amelia Earhart of autism, mm -hmm. and someone who I have a great deal of admiration. And I've read her books and. You know, her articles and listen to some of her talks. And I think I like one she's thing a she says is don't put yourself in the other creature or other person's shoes. You have to put yourself into their mind and what they're going through. She uses it a lot to explain how to train different animals. Um, but I think that important it's something a lot of people miss if you put yourself in that scenario you're not necessarily ex uh, understanding the problem you have to understand other people think differently such and animals think differently so if you're dealing with someone at autism you can't just say oh what would i do in that scenario it would be what would an autistic person do and experience and feel yes 
So we have a agree. question from Megan. It says, Chloe, I really enjoyed your talk in Redondo Beach. I enjoyed meeting Professor Lee too. So I had a workshop last week that uh, Professor Lee Newton came to and sold some of the books at. There's been much talk in the medical community, community about testing for mutations through such tests as ancestry and then uploading to such sites as Genetic Genie. What are your thoughts about this going forward? So, uh, uh, if you're very, talking about very positive. autism as a or just like mutations in general, I'm kind of confused by that. Yes, it's not a very nice word either, mutations. The <laughs> differences would be perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mutation. It reminds me of sci, sci fi movies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can kind of. Kind of yeah. in, you know, 40s magazines. Superheroes, who are they in sci-fi movies? They're mutated individuals, right? <laughs> the genes got mutated, and then they, they become superheroes. So in a sense, Hollywood gave us a very positive, or comic books, give us a very positive outlook on mutated people. They don't see them as monsters. They see them as superheroes because they have this new ability, new fun abilities, to save the world, you know, to fight the monsters, to, you know, to catch the bad guys. So it's been amazing. But that question actually is a very good question. That I can think of two things. Number one is uh, privacy issues, right? So when, you know, you upload the DNA information or someone, your know, family's DNA information to the, to the central database, you know, then you lose some kind, you lose the control over your own privacy, right? And that only not only affects you, but also all your extended family and generations to come. It can be your grand, 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 grandchildren. Okay, somehow it will be related and connected somehow genetically to you. And you know, well, the plus side of that is that they can catch criminals better, right? They have some cold cases that they use a genetic database, ancestry database, to actually find you know the killers, which is that's a good thing. But the bad thing is that you know, uh, criminal cyber criminals or uh, insurance companies and, you know, can can take up all kind of information right illegally, whether it's legally or illegally, and then you know do whatever they need to maximize the profits based on information that you volunteer, uh, you know, to give away. It's like it's like uh, you sign up to, for Facebook. You you have all these pictures. You know, you like ice cream. You like to watch Titanic. Whatever. All this information are gathered by Facebook, by Google, by, you know, whoever wants to market to, to you. Uh, but again, there's a plus and minus. The plus is I want to be market to about things I like, right? I want, if there's a new book that they think I like to read, I want to know about it. That's a good thing. But the bad thing is that they keep, you know, sending me junk mail, junk information, you know, email me all the time. That I don't want, you know, it's just, it's just too much information, information overload. So there's always a plus and minus. In yeah, one if time. they were to do that, because you're not signing up for that study, it should be in that in some sort of agreement that you know when you get your ancestry information, your some of your information is always also going to these other places, because that's not right to just take that information without people knowing that they're giving that private stuff to some company or to some research or whatever is using that information. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that, that a greater transparency is, is certainly required. And as genetic testing becomes more and more accurate and more and more detailed, uh, you know, that these are ethical questions that, that politicians and, and legislators are, are going to have to confront sooner or later and with the rate of improvement in terms of genetic uh, analytic technology the, the sooner that question is addressed and answered the better. 
I think that the whole world needs to start having a very serious discussion about the use of genetic material. I mean, on the plus side, a fantastic amount to be learned there. And it, and it could be one of the, the great gifts to humanity. On the, on the other side, as Professor Lee says, uh, the issues of privacy, um, of misuse of, of information. I mean, information itself is neutral in how it's used. And I, I think there do need to be guidelines about how information is used. And the more, the more pressing I think that is to uh, address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do like the fact that, you know, uh, in medical research, we need more data. And the data sometimes are you know, collected because people volunteer for them. Uh, so to me, that has a huge benefit, uh, even though there's always a risk of, you know, being misused, but oh well, we do it for the greater good, I suppose, <laughs> you know. So it's yeah. better to share ideas, just like, you know, uh, patents, for example, has been misused put, to protect things, you know, because we don't, we really want to advance techn technology. Why do you want to patent so that nobody can else can use it? That's stupid, right? You want to patent this? Yes, that's a good idea. Yeah. But you still should let people advance it so that, you know, it can benefit uh, more people, you know, benefit to society instead of just one person or one company, you know, so. What, what Jonas did when he did the polio vaccine, he, he prevented it being. Dead. I mean, he never made a, a, a penny out of it. But, mm -hmm. but when you be dead, I mean that that would that would be ideal in every world. Mm -hmm. Right. So Returning to the topic of autism, because we only have a few more minutes left. Um, I'm curious. Um, just because you, you would have more stories about um, be, uh, before I was born living with autism and different things you went through. So when were you diagnosed with autism, Ian? That's a, that's a cool question. Um, I suppose... Bearing in mind that, 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 as we were talking about earlier, that it, it really wasn't back then. Um, but uh, my parents, and they, they told me this when I was older, I didn't know it at the time. Um, they're, they're, I was at primary school, I, I think you would say in America, elementary school, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, my parents were getting a lot of uh, not very positive feedback, shall we say, and they, they took me to see a psychologist down in Plymouth, which was a, a very long way away from where we lived. Uh, my mother explained to me afterwards, some years afterwards, that uh, what the psychologist has said was that uh, uh, I would be a late boomer, what we would now diagnose as PDDNOS which is one of the one of the unique traits of, of Asperger's. But technically I was uh, diagnosed at the age of seven. I wasn't I was diagnosed as being autistic uh, either my first or second year at university uh, one of the people in the psychology department although I was not studying psychology and I was diagnosed by uh, Professor William Fraser, who was very well known to Europe as Asperger's, um, when I was over 40. So it, it was sort of those three, those three stages of, you know, each one was more um, exact than the one before. And um, when I did the genetic testing uh, that we discussed earlier, um, that that definitely confirmed it completely. So um, yeah, it's a sort of a tricky question to answer. It's probably the best I can. It was in those those three steps, each about twenty years apart. Hmm. 
So you don't have to answer this, but I'm curious, how did you feel when you were given the diagnosis? Were you accepting of it? Did it make things make sense? I've had a lot of um, people with a later diagnosis think it was like a revolutionary thing and really important that it made a lot of things make sense where an earlier diagnosis people people really not felt anything toward it until there was a a, a more positive change in their life be, due to the diagnosis so i'm curious where you fall on on that personally well very in mind i already knew that i was on the you know on the autism spectrum uh, the, the Asperger's diagnosis, it, it, it came as a surprise. I didn't have any problem at all in accepting it because I had such, I knew quite a lot about the psychologist who, who diagnosed it, who really was one of the, he's retired now, but he was then one of the, the top experts. So I had no problem accepting it. Um, I think it took me about two years to process it, and as I, I obviously I, he told me a lot about it and gave me pointers as to where to research and what kind of questions to ask if I want. And as I as I went through doing um, things things in my at that point started to make a great deal more sense than they ever had done before so it was a, it was a sort of a I don't know it was a sort of a, a, a growing and uh, and, and that, that's still continuing up to up to now you know that, that every now and again I'll get a memory from the past and think oh yeah that's what <laughs> so uh, yes, it 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 took quite a while to, as I say, to process it. But it's 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 something that I'm I'm comfortable with now. Uh, I remember because I got the diagnosis at sixteen. When I got all the information that came from it, that because there was sort of an IQ test that came with it that told me my strengths and my struggles. One of the things it said that I, it was almost impossible for me to memorize facts. Uh, my memorization was almost not on the scale at all. And I remember arguing with people in the past, like I can't memorize that. I don't know what you expect from me. And they're like, no, you can't. And, and, now I'm like, look, I have proof. Like I literally can't memorize these sets of numbers that you're asking me to memorize for your test or whatever they were asking me to do. I need to really understand it. I can't just memorize it. And so that really helped me to have that, to feel validated in that, that I wasn't just making something up that wasn't real. Because when you're told that by so many people that what you're saying is wrong, it it can make you feel like, okay, man, maybe they're right. Maybe I can actually do this if I try. So it was really yeah. nice getting that diagnosis that told me what I believed was ac actually correct. Yeah, I found very much the same thing. The, the thing that you know, what you were saying about the vision and that you could show and or when people have said, you know, said what they said to you, um, so that's a very eroding process, uh, and you know, it, it it does do damage to one's self-esteem or or whatever. You feel you kind of come up short. Um, and when I got my diagnosis, um, that that very much changed my perception of myself. 
just like you, it came with an IQ test and it came with various psychometric tests for personality traits. Um, yeah, and it's 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 something that uh, you know did make a great deal of sense, and it's it's, it's difficult. I, I'm sure that the well, actually convinced that the the earlier you get the diagnosis, the better. Um, I mean, I, I do wish I'd known it a long time ago, but hey, better late than never. But there, I, there's no doubt it's. It, if you get it late, there's no doubt that it, you know, the, what you were saying about earlier, those, those, the, the negatives you get when people expect more of you than you, you actually can do, it, it definitely damages your self-confidence. And, uh, and I don't think anybody really ever recovers completely from that. So really, so I, I really do people. want to leave a final so, question. We'll get to that. Do uh, Newton or Ian, do you have any final thoughts before uh, we end the broadcast? Well, I do. Well, um, so I think that a lot of times people try to label things, right? Like, uh, like some kind of disease, they give a label, you know, this kind of situation to give it a label but some a lot of times that that kind of put a restriction or expectation on people or circumstances okay and as a result we cannot get past it we cannot overcome it because you know it's already labeled right so to me that's pretty sad what we need to do is to overcome that say look you know it doesn't matter the skin color your eye color you know your you know iq Num it's just a number, I guess a number anyway. It doesn't matter what they are. We need to, you know, we can accomplish a lot regardless of all that ex circumstances, regardless of uh, physical and mental limitation. Uh, that's why education is important. That's why, you know, research is important. And that's why we need to give people opportunities to study the scholarships is you know, very important. So all these things, if you, if you put, if you, if you, um, if you fertile, I mean, if you um, fertilize the soil, okay, the plant is going to grow and bear fruit. Okay, it doesn't matter. There may be others, you know, negative circumstances. So yes, you know, people of autism has a disadvantage. People who who have you know, certain type of physical disabilities have disadvantages, obviously, right? But that all everything can be overcome, and not just overcoming by using science and technology, but also by mindset, by, you know, social support, family support, friends, and, you know, and, and things like that. I think if you put everything together, we're going to see, uh, you know, good results. I agree. Uh, my sort of thing I'd, I'd like to complete this with would be to say, that well two things the, the earlier you know the better because obviously you can you know what kind of support to to access mm -hmm. and, and so, um, keep trying mm -hmm. don't give up that's a message I, I want to send out Keep trying. Don't don't give up on yourself, ever. All right. Thank you for joining me, Ian Hale, uh, Professor Newton Lee. Uh, please check out. I have a link to the book on Amazon. You can buy Asperger's Autism and You. It's available uh, through that link. Also check out artism.com where you can check out my blogs where I write about living on the spectrum. Also the support groups and life map. Life map is a great program that helps you define your goals and then breaks down it into small pieces about how to achieve it.
and I do that once a week and it's been really helpful to continue this live stream and everything that I'm doing I'm going to be working on my workshop next week um, so I'm really excited for uh, all these new things I'm doing I have a new workshop in April in Florida all the links are on my Facebook page I will try to get you all the links that were mentioned um, in this broadcast. So if you want to get, get those to me, email them to me, I'll share them. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys Thank you so for much. watching. Comes back next week at seven o'clock Wednesday, Pacific Standard Time. And I'll have a guest on next week. I think it's Zoe. I, I, we're gonna try to, uh, she missed hers as well, she was sick. So we'll try to get Zoe Martin back on. <laughs> so really excited about that. Thank you, Dr. Ian Hale and Professor Newton Lee for, for coming on uh, Starlight Talks. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting us. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much, very, very enjoyable. It's an absolute pleasure. All right. And, uh, Bye, everyone. Stay colorful. Bye-bye. Cheers. <laughs>